Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. September 6, 1990, there was a young man that was doing just that. He was giving careful thought to his ways. He'd been out all night long partying, celebrating his 26th birthday, but when he had come home early in the morning, he came home to an empty house. Gone was his wife of seven years. Gone were his three precious children with her. And who could blame her? As he thought, he thought, how could I be so selfish? This whole time I've been chasing my own dreams and, and doing what I wanted to do and partying and acting like I was just somebody special and all the time I was leaving my family behind. I had basically abandoned my wife, my children as I pursued empty dreams. And so he was giving careful thought to his ways. And as he sat there in his living room on the floor, he realized his life was broken with no hope in sight. And so he wept bitterly. 2,500 years earlier, there was another man who was as equally broken. See, he was a leader. His name was Zerubbabel. He led, he was supposed to lead the nation, the remnant of the tribe, the nation of Israel. He was supposed to lead them. He was supposed to rebuild the temple. And he had come back and he had led the team and they had done wonderful work. But at some point, he had failed miserably as a leader. And the only thing he could see in front of him was brokenness. A broken foundation that had been covered by weeds and dust that had been sitting there for 16 years. And he wept bitterly, utterly broken. But hope was on the horizon. And that hope came in the form of two prophets named Haggai and Zechariah. Two men that God had sent to this leader and to the tri and to the people of Israel, the nation of Judah. He had sent them to speak his truth and to offer hope and reconciliation and restoration if they would just follow him. And so today we're going to meet these two prophets. These two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. The last of the two prophets that we'll cover in this series where we've been looking at major lessons from minor prophets. And so first, I want to call your attention to these guys, Haggai and Zechariah. And before I begin, I know that some of you out there are, are name purists. And some of you would say, well, his name is actually Haggai. And I would say, it is Haggai. But for the sake of today, can we all be syllable conservationists? Can we just say a few syllables? Let's just call him Haggai. Can we do that? Y'all are okay with that? Amen. So we're going to call them Haggai. But Haggai and Zechariah, first and foremost, they were partners in prophecy. They actually were contemporaries. A lot of people don't realize that of all the, the, the minor prophets, they were the only ones that prophesied to the same audience at the same time in history. They were contemporaries. Oh, but they were quite different, weren't they? If you look at the image behind, this is the artist's rendition of the two. Guess which one is which? Well... Hey guys, actually the older fellow up there, he was a more seasoned prophet, much more experienced. In fact, some people think that he was probably in his 70s at the time when actually uh, we read about the, him in Haggai and we read in the book of Ezra also. I think he was by his 70s. He probably was actually saw the original temple of Solomon. We'll cover that in a minute. But Haggai, more seasoned, experienced. He was also a man of very few words. In fact, he's only two pages. Look at your Bibles. Two pages, Haggai, right? Man, he had some powerful words though. He packed a lot of punch. His counterpart, on the other hand, was quite opposite. In fact, he was young. He was kind of a voice of a new generation, right? And he actually spoke, and he actually had visions. He was a real visionary leader. 
Like literally, he had visions and he had eight of them, as a matter of fact. And he spoke a little, little lengthier. That was about 14 chapters in the Bible. We read Zechariah. And so the two, quite different, but each packed a really powerful and unified message of hope and restoration to a broken nation. And so we're going to take a look. Let's just kind of look and see, like, when did these two, what, when did when their place of history, when did that actually occur? So what I want to do is I want to kind of walk you back in history so you get a little understanding of the context of the audience they were, they were speaking to and they were preaching to. So way back over here, around 930, way off our, our sketch up here, uh, actually around 930, there was a king, and his name was Solomon. And he actually ended his reign, and he died in 930 B.C., and when Solomon died, his two sons, you know how boys are, especially sons, they can never get along, right? I've got three sons, so I know. Well, they started a fight, right? And they had these two, this fighting, these two sons, and they both wanted to be king. And so what you have is you actually have the split of the nation of Israel, of which Solomon was the king. And then you have the northern kingdom, which was Israel. The southern kingdom, of course, was named Judah. There were 10 tribes in the northern kingdom, and there were two tribes in the southern kingdom. So two kingdoms. Well, as we move across the timeline, you see in around 722 BC, the northern kingdom, Israel, falls, wiped out by the Assyrians. They come in and completely destroy the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom remains, Judah remains, but around 586, they are actually destroyed and con or conquered and destroyed by the Babylonians. And in so doing, the Babylonians take a large po population of those Judah, the folks that were living in Judah, the what's left, the remnant of the nation of Israel, and they take them into captivity off to Babylon. And they're there in exile for about 70 years. And as part of conquering and destroying the, the city of Jerusalem, the nation, what happened was they destroyed the temple. The temple that had stood for about 400 years, Solomon, King Solomon, had constructed this massive temple. And in that temple, God's glory was manifest. And so this temple stood as a sign of, it was the religious place. It was absolutely the highest place you could go as far as the Jewish religion was concerned. It was also a sign of cultural and national pride. The temple meant everything. And in 586, the Babylonians came in and completely wiped it out, destroyed it. Well, 539, there's a new king. The Babylonians get taken out by the Persians and the Persian king comes in and says, you know what? Why don't we let all of these people that have been living in exile return to their homelands? And he actually encourages the people of Judah to return to their homeland and rebuild their temple and continue to practice their religious ways. Wow, powerful story. And so this remnant comes back. About 50,000 people come back. And they're excited to be back because the first task that God's given them is to actually go and rebuild the temple so that God can be present. God's glory can be manifest with them. And so they do. They start out and they do great work and the foundation's laid. And guess what happens? Well, a little bit of opposition. And you know, around 539, they come back. You got, oh, let's see, 16 years later, they've made very little progress. And so God sends these two powerful, powerful prophets in to speak truth to the people of Israel. And the first thing we learn about these two, Haggai and Zechariah, is that they provided the people with the exhortation, inspiration, encouragement to do God's will. See, the people had actually given up hope. And they were following their own ways. They'd forgotten about this faithful God, and instead they were, they were pursuing their own thing. The other thing was they also called the leadership of Jerusalem and Judah in, to really into account, to greater accountability. And in so doing, that one of the men was named Zerubbabel. I talked about him earlier. And Zerubbabel was the project leader. He was the governor of Judah. He was ultimately responsible to make sure that this project was done, was complete. And he had failed. And there was another man. His name was Joshua, the high priest. And the high priest in the Jewish faith was the highest level of priest that you could have. And Joshua was in charge of the spiritual side. He was supposed to make sure that the people were continuing to practice and worship God and honor God by putting him at the place of honor and highest priority. Zerubbabel and Joshua had failed 
miserably. And so in come Haggai and Zechariah, and they come in to offer these people hope and restoration and pursuing the passion and pursuing God, which should be their first priority. And so Haggai and Zechariah, as we look at these two powerful prophets, and we say, what major lessons can we learn from these two? What are some major lessons that we can learn from Haggai and Zechariah? And the first thing I think we would say is that God deserves the highest priority and place of honor. God deserves the highest priority and place of honor. You see, the faithful God of their ancestors, this God who had not forgotten about his people, he told them that he was gonna bring them back out of exile. And when they got back, this was priority one. Job one, rebuild the temple. And how had they responded? We read in Haggai 1, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. And that's the temple, the Lord's house, the temple. And the people had said, it's not yet time. It's not yet time. So God's calling them out. And God says, then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Yeah, paneling was actually cool back then. Kind of like the 70s, right? <laughs> it wasn't quite the same paneling that we had, right? A little bit different. Actually, really, paneled houses was actually houses that had like cedar wood this beautiful cedar wood. So inside these houses, the walls and the ceilings were covered with cedar wood. Can you imagine that? These people had no time to build the Lord's house, but they had time to get this cedar wood. Now, cedar wood, obviously, in Jerusalem was very, it was a rare commodity. There weren't a lot of trees in Jerusalem at the time. And so this was like, this would be the equivalent today if like she said, hey, honey, I'm thinking about trimming the windows in gold, like solid gold. Oh yeah, honey, that'd be great. How about the doors? Let's do the doors in solid gold. I mean, can you imagine that? But that's what the people were doing. And God says, hey, give careful thought to your ways. He says, this, no, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Like a never-ending cycle, right? Everything they're doing, just everything, it's all about themselves. And it's getting them nowhere. And so we read in verse seven, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. God's basically saying, lace up your boots, roll up your sleeves, get up on the hill and get down and rebuild this temple, get her done. God says, rebuild the temple. Because without a temple, God couldn't bless them. He wanted them to obey him so that he could bless them with his presence. And they had missed the point. And so God told him to give careful thought to your ways, that deep self-examination. And what did it reveal to the people? What did it reveal to them? Well, they had a couple of problems, didn't they? The first thing they had was a priority problem. You see, they had put their priorities on top of God's priorities. And their priorities were out of whack. I mean, they were spending all of their time, all their energy, all their resources on themselves. And they also had a satisfaction problem. They just weren't satisfied with anything because ultimately, you know what it really boiled down to was they didn't just have a priority problem. They had a perspective problem. You see, they had forgotten about the goodness of God and his great promise for them, the goodness of God's blessing in their lives. And they thought, man, the obstacles are just too great. There's too much opposition. I'm not building that temple. And God had to remind them, God had to kind of refocus their perspective. It's kind of like if, if I like replaced my glasses and like decided to put these on instead. <laughs> Can you imagine me trying to drive with these, trying to do anything with these, right? I'm just getting a headache just putting them on. They're horrible. Their perspective was clouded. They were seeing things 
without clarity. And God had to refocus and renew their perspective. And how did he do it? God reminded them that he should be their focus. You see, because by failing to obey and pursue God's priorities, here's the real sad thing. They were missing the blessing. They were missing the blessing in their lives and they were missing the blessing in their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren's lives. Missing the blessing because they had messed up priorities and a whole mixed up perspective. So the next lesson I think we learn is that God desires repentance, reconciliation, and return to him. I'm gonna say that one again. God desires repentance, reconciliation, and return to him. You see, God wants to be in relationship with his children, just like he wanted to be in his rela- in relationship with the children of Israel. He wants desperately to be in relationship with us as his children even today. And so God desires what he knows is best for his children. And what he knows is best is a right relationship with his children. And so God, in Zechariah 1, we read this this amazing, amazing piece of scripture. It says, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, the son of Edo. The Lord was very angry with your ancestors. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your ancestors to whom whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices. But they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your ancestors now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants and the prophets, overtake your ancestors? You see, God was saying, don't be like them. Look where it got him. And these wonderful words, the people, and says here, then they repented and said, the Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve, just as he determined to do. You see, they had given careful thought and they were reminded of God's great love for them and his good promise and plan for them. And they repented and they returned to God. It's like they were walking this way, right? They were walking this way. I'm gonna build my own house. Cedar sounds good. I'm gonna keep building. And God says, no, 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 no. Return to me. I wanna bless you. And they went just like this. They turned around and they said, Lord, we're sorry. And they turned back, confessed their wrongdoing and pursued God. Beautiful illustration. And so when they were confronted with the truth, the people's response was to repent. And so how then did God respond to them? How did God treat them when they repented and returned to him? I think of a story one time. Amy and I were, we had four children and we have four children and our youngest son, Grant, was about two years old. And we'd gone to a pool. We were at a hotel and spending some time together as family. We were kind of, Amy and I were sitting on the edge of the pool and and our two oldest uh, sons, Ryan and Jacob, they were out swimming because they had already learned how to swim. This is before swimmies, right? We didn't have little swimmies. And our youngest two, Amanda and Grant, were sitting over here and there was like a shallow end and there were some steps. And Grant and and Amanda were playing over there on the steps. And, And I remember saying, Grant, make sure, you and Amanda, make sure you guys don't go off the steps. Stay on the steps. And Amy and I were just talking away and all of a sudden, Amanda goes, Daddy, Mommy, Grant's drowning. And I turned, and no more than five feet away, three or four feet of water, there's my son, and he's going, his little legs are turning, and he's just trying to get back. And I just went, boom, and I grabbed him out of the water. And what do you think I did with him? You think I threw him back in and said, learn how to swim? (laughs) I held him as close as I could ever hold him. And his mom came along and put a blanket over him. And I just embraced him. That's how God loves his children when they return to him. They recognize they're going the wrong way and God embraced him. And what he did to the nation of Israel, what he did was he then stirred up the spirit. He stirred up the spirit of the leaders. And what happened was they then went back. They had a renewed perspective of God and they started the rebuilding effort again. 
And amazingly, if you read through the rest of Haggai and the book of Zechariah and the book of Ezra, you will see that in four years, they were able to rebuild the temple, something they hadn't been able to do in 16 years before that. Renewed perspective, renewed priorities. God had done that. So our major lesson number three, God delivers hope, healing, and restoration for his people. You see, the remnant of Israel was restored. But what about the leaders? What about Zerubbabel? And what about Joshua? These two men that had failed to lead by example, had failed to lead the way they should have led. How did God treat them? Well, first we see an indicator of God's love for his people. As we read this great story in Zechariah 3, verses one through seven, this vision of the heavenly courts Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? You see, Joshua's fate was inevitable. He was like a burning stick, right? That's what God's saying. He's like a burning stick, burning, inevitable fate. He's going to destruction, but we also hear God snatched him. He deserved death. God snatched him. That's God's grace. God's grace right here in this vision. Verse three, now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. And now we read that, we think, oh, it's just a little bit of dirt, right? Probably get a Tide pen, we could get rid of that. No. You know what filthy clothes, the Hebrew language is actually getting it? He's covered in animal dung. He's covered from head to toe in animal dung. Joshua, covered. That's a great pictured illustration of sin and shame and brokenness and guilt. And we read, then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. He's gonna cleanse him. He's gonna heal him. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among those standing here. Did you note the contrast between Satan's role and God's role? How Satan was ready to be the accuser. Literally, in Hebrew, Satan is the accuser. And he stands to the right side of Joshua. And Joshua, he's just, he's probably just hammering him. You're guilty. What a poor leader. How could you ever lead people to worship? You can't even do this. You're guilty. The shame, the anguish. Joshua, a picture of hopelessness. Notice how God delivers him. How does God deal with Joshua? First, he rebukes Satan. He stands between Satan and Joshua. And then there's this powerful illustration. Take off those filthy clothes. The shame, the guilt, the sin. Take that off, and I'm gonna cover you in new garments. Clothe you. Make you in right standing with me. And then he restores him. He restores him and says, if you walk in my ways, you will continue to be the high priest of Israel. Restored him to his position. But what about Zerubbabel, the guy we talked about earlier? We read in Haggai 2.23, it says that on that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring. For I've chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. See, Zerubbabel, God was saying, you're gonna be like my ring, my signet ring. And, and a signet ring really is this, it's a ring with a raised impression, right? And so, so as you have this, this metal is raised and it's got a special way. It's, it's in, and when this king would wanna send a letter, he'd wanna send something, they would take wax. And the king then, he would dip the ring into the wax, the hot wax. And that hot wax then on that letter would come in a sealed letter and somebody would look at this sealed letter and they'd be like, that's from the king, Right? And what God was saying was, Zerubbabel, you're gonna be like my signet ring. 
I'm gonna bless you and you're gonna be a blessing for generations to come. Restored him to his position as leader, governor of Judah. And so how does the same God who delivered hope and restoration and healing for the nation of Israel, for the people of Judah, for the leaders of Judah, how does he do the same for us? He did it through the promised Messiah. If you read in Zechariah 9.9, we read, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Where have you read that before? Maybe you've never read that before. See, over 500 years later, Jesus, the promised Messiah, would enter the city of Jerusalem on the back of the foal of a donkey. And Jesus, the Messiah, would walk the temple courts. Great glory, the greater glory than the original temple, greater glory than the newly constructed temple. Jesus would come and he would bring hope, he would bring healing, he would teach and he would restore people's lives. In Jerusalem, Jesus also, he would go to the cross. And in so going to the cross, Jesus would take away the sins of all man for all time. And then in that moment, he offers us, us, all men, women, the opportunity to be cleansed, to be healed, to be restored. Jesus, the promised Messiah. And so if Haggai and Zechariah were here today, maybe you'd have to get a bigger stone. There'd be two of them here, right? What would these two prophets want to say to us today? What would they say to us? I think the first thing they would say is, God still needs to be our priority. You see, God, he loves us. He knows what's best for us. He created us. And so God knows that that he needs to be at the top of our list. He needs to be our focus. And so what we need to realize is that obedience to God still matters. When we obey God, not only are we pleasing God, but we're also giving God the opportunity to bless us because his will and his ways are best for us. So God still needs to be our top priority. So we have to ask ourselves, as we give careful thought to our ways, how are we spending our time? Where are we focusing our energy, our resources? Now, God's love doesn't change for you. It's not about how much time you spend or how much money you spend or how many resources or what energy you put into it. God's gonna love you the same. Guess what? God wants to bless us. He wants to bless us. And so living in obedience to him, sharing, serving him is the best way for us to feel and be and and live in his blessing. God still needs to be our priority. God still offers hope Healing and restoration. That's another thing I think they'd tell us. You see, like Joshua the high priest, maybe we find ourselves in a situation where we feel kind of hopeless. Maybe our life is in shambles. Maybe as we look around at our life, we say, is there anything in my life right now that I believe God can't forgive me of? Is there anything in my life that I believe God won't love me because of what I've done? I see, God is great love for you. There's nothing outside of his will. God, nothing is outside of his ability. And if it's his will, he will do it. And it was his will. His will was to bring you into relationship with him because he sent the Messiah, his son, to pay the price for your sin, the sin that separates us from God. And so if you choose to follow Jesus, the Messiah, he will transform your life, your marriage, your relationships, your work, your school, whatever it is, Jesus will transform your life. And finally, God still uses brokenness and broken people for his glory. Do you remember Zerubbabel? Well, God used Zerubbabel in a powerful way. He restored him to his leadership. 
And if you go back and read in the book of Luke and the book of Matthew, and you look at Jesus Christ's lineage, you'll find the name Zerubbabel. You see, 11 generations after Zerubbabel, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came out of his lineage. The signet ring, God's stamp of approval for generations, for eternity to come. And we look at our lives and we say, does my story matter? My story of brokenness, my story of restoration. And you might say, Pastor Sean, you have no idea how broken my life is right now. You have no idea how broken my marriage is right now. You have no idea how broken my relationships with others are right now. And I can only tell you, you're right. I have no idea how broken your lives are. But what I can tell you is that my life was equally broken. Because on September 6, 1990, I was the broken man that was seated in the living room. I was the broken man whose marriage had gone, whose children were gone, whose wife was gone. But three days of sitting there, anguishing, weeping bitterly, my wife returned. My wife of seven years had returned, and she came back and she said, honey, I offer forgiveness. I forgive you for everything you've done. And in her arm, she was carrying one arm, she had her one-year-old baby girl. And in the other arm, she was carrying a Bible, the Good News Bible. And she said, honey, I forgive you, but our marriage can never continue until you have the right relationship. And I said, honey, I'm ready to do whatever I can, ever I can do. She said, honey, it's not with me. It's with Jesus. And for the first time in my life, someone shared the good news the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he came to earth. He paid the price for my sin and offered me a free gift of salvation, eternal life, offered to forgive all my sins. And he offered it for free. And in that moment, I kneeled down with my wife and one-year-old daughter and I accepted Christ. And he transformed my life forever. And not only that, but our marriage, it was restored. Now our marriage, just like anybody in here who's been married, it's been a rocky road, hasn't it? It's a rocky road. But with Christ at the center, all things are possible. And he has brought us to reconciliation. He's restored our marriage. And what's really neat is I have the honor today to share that story, my story of brokenness and God's restoration in my life. 34 years after my wife and I were married on this same day. And there's an image of that happy couple. Now, I'm not sure why she would marry anybody with a haircut like that, but she did. <laughs> 34 years later, and just last year, my wife and I gave that one-year-old daughter, we gave her hand away in marriage. There's a picture of that. A family that was broken, restored to the gospel and the saving truth and hope that we find in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's my prayer for you today, that you will find hope, healing, and restoration in Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, your Savior and mine. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God of hope, a God of restoration, and a God who loves us beyond compare. And so, Lord, today we gather in this place, and we come from all different walks, all different backgrounds, and all different situations, conditions of life. And some, Lord, have known you deeply for many, many years. And so, Lord, today would it be a reminder of your great love for them, no matter what they're, at, what they're doing, where they're at, Lord, your great love for them. They can continue to pursue you and continue to love and lead others in a relationship towards you. And Lord, we also know that there may be others who don't know you yet. They've never even heard the story of your great love. So Lord, today, in this time, and as we sing this next song, Lord, would you speak to them through the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you speak to all of us to be reminded of your great love for us, to restore us, to bring us into right relationship with you? Only through the power and the love of Jesus Christ. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name, amen.